Hey, Mike. Hey, hold on. There we go. Hi. Hi there. Hi, Sage. How's everyone doing? You know, I'm good. Good. Where are you guys all calling from? All over the place. <laughs> So uh, that's the way the Zoom world lives right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so myself, Scott, Amy, and Charlie, we're all in Columbus, Ohio. Okay. Oh, oh yeah, Rogue headquarters, huh? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And the home of the Arnold. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And then Cat is from Delaware. Delaware. Hi. Is that Echo a city Street. or a state? <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> you guys were just out here, right? Was the whole family out? No, oh, just the, uh, the boss and I were, were out <laughs> visiting my son, uh, Cody, who lives in uh, D.C. Nice. Or Alexandria. He works uh, with the fire department of Prince William County, down okay. by Quantico. Oh, and yeah. then we, uh, they have, uh, the mother-in-law has, and dad, father-in-law have a lake house down on Anna Lake. Nice. So we're, we were there for a couple of days, and that was really fun. Little R&R. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. So how are you guys doing? We're doing amazing. I'm doing amazing. Not she's not so much. I'm her. always doing amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were doing good. Piper Piper and I went on a big beach walk today at you know about three or four miles and had fun down there and uh of course she had to greet and meet everybody and <laughs> And when she greets him, she just pees all over their feet. So oh, Piper is a dog, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was my third daughter. That was a... yeah. And did and you have... guys you guys got litter mates, right? Sage, yeah. you have, do you did you get one too? Bi yes, I have Hank. He hmm. is way more well behaved than Piper, <laughs> way cuter, and about twenty pounds heavier. Oh. Us yeah. Hank, Hank the Tank, right? Yeah, Piper yeah. is 34 pounds. Hank is 50. Wow. Already. The and guy is a beast. <laughs> and what kind of, the, Clydesdale, what kind of the Clydesdale of the Golden Doodles, right? He seems like it, yeah. And he, he definitely <laughs> cannot keep up with the athleticism of Sassy Piper. <laughs> but he tries really hard, and that's all I care about. You guys don't really have a competitive family at all, do you? No. No. Uh -huh. no, we're not competitive. I got the best dog. <laughs> According to him. Well, we are so glad that you guys took some time out to, to talk with us today. Uh, I know I have done your warm up at least 2,000 times. Yay! Yep, I'll be expecting a demo soon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So let's start there. Um, I actually watched, watched one of your instructional videos uh, in the last couple of days about the Burgunder warm-up and why you do it. And uh, can you just kind of walk us through why that is so important in Olympic lifting? Well, there's a little bit of history to the Burgunder warm-up. And, you know, let me go over that real quick. But um, years ago, I, I played football at Notre Dame and my coach was Eric Parsegian. Mm -hmm. And uh, Era hated Ohio State, but uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> he just had to go there. I had to go there. But anyway, uh, he sent me down to the weight room at, at Notre Dame at the time, which was really uh, owned and designed and developed by a Catholic priest by the name of Father Lang. And Father Lang was our coach, and uh, and he had us doing all kinds of different things for warm ups. But I developed this one thing that I like doing. I put together, you know, five exercises, and then later on I put it up, put together another five exercises. And I just decided that I was going to do those every single day, that I that I was a lifter. And uh, when Glassman came into the the picture of CrossFit, and uh, you know, he wanted me to certify him, and you know, Greg Amundsen and Nicole Carroll and all these other people back in the, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, early 2000s, um, he asked me what the name of this warm-up was. And I honestly said, I don't have a name. I just do it. My PE kids did it every single day that I taught physical education, weight training. They knew that they had to jog to get loosened up. They had to come in and do the junkyard dog. And then they had to do the burden of warm-up and the skill transfer exercises. They did that every single day. 
And he was impressed by that, but he wanted to know what it was called. And I said, I don't have a name for it. And Sage came up and said, well, why don't you call it uh, the Burden of Warm Up? Genius. How could I even think of a name like that? <laughs> Amazing. And it, that's, Suck. you know, that shows you what kind of a dumbass I am, right? But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, so she gets, she really gets the credit of naming the Burden of Warm Up and the skill transfer exercises are just, other exercises that we put together, and I just called them the skill transfer exercises. When we named the burden of warm up, we decided we better name the skill transfer exercises as well. So the skill transfer exercises is what what uh, fit, you know. So so we do that every day, and it, it's and I learned that, believe it or not, I learned that from my coach, uh, Era Parsegian, but I took it from Woody Hayes, Bo Schembecker, Vince Lombardi that every, the, the first 15 minutes of any practice, they work nothing but drills and skills and fundamentals. And weightlifting is no different. If you will do your work, if you will work your drills and your skills and your fundamentals and try to not to put the cart before the horse, right? Try not to lift too heavy too soon. If you'll do it the right way, then you'll make much quicker development than if you do it the wrong way. Because you always have to come back to the beginning anyway if you do it the wrong way. So that's the story of it. And it's, uh, you know, it's been a, you know, no one does it, no one knows us from, for anything but the burden of warm up. <laughs> that's where we, that's kind of a. And our amazing personalities. Yeah, it's our, it. our non-competitive personalities. Yeah. Well, well, my big question is, did Sage get all the royalties because she named it? She, I better. She, I'm she, sure it's in the will somewhere. She gets a hundred percent, a hundred percent of what I've got. <laughs> big, right. big goose egg. Yeah, the burners are weird. We, you know, I grew up in a. I was very blessed to have the ability to, you know, go to Notre Dame and and to, back in that day, Father Lane gave away so much, and all the people I surrounded myself were coaches. They. No one would ever think about charging for coaching. You know, it just wasn't done in the day. And when, you know, when I moved out here and we, we opened up my garage to Mike's gym, you know, we just didn't charge people. And then about, uh, what, 2000 and, I don't know, 2000 maybe, I had, uh, I met a, a beach volleyball uh, coach and uh, her name was Dee Dee Bodner and uh, she had two sets of Olympians for beach volleyball and she asked if I would train them and I said well yeah I, I guess and she said well what will you charge them I said I don't charge and she said no 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 no, no. you got to charge them so I ended up charging them charging two of them 15 bucks <laughs> that that was that was my charge, and I thought I was a millionaire. You know, so anyway, and then you know, then CrossFit comes on, and you know, I learned to do the courses, and we made, you know, made it made a very good living doing that after I retired from teaching. So, so one of the questions I have about the warm up that I never knew until I watched your instructional video, is that the whole time through it, it's about staying over the center. Right. The center, uh, of the, the center of the base. You yeah. have to. You can't sit back. You can't be on the balls of your feet. And I could, sh I could show you 30,000 videos of the Polish-Russian weightlifters, which was what we take our philosophy off of. And it is all about big toe, little toe, and heel being equally balanced all the way through the pattern and staying flat-footed as long as you can. So when we do the burden of warm up, we really stress and emphasize that on all the movement patterns. And if, if you make a mistake there, then either way, if you're too far back, you're going to jump forward. If you're too far forward, you're going to jump forward. So you don't want to be in a situation where you end up, you know, being back on your heels and the bar bangs off your hips and swings around your head. You want to kind of push the platform away from you so you get vertical hips. Vertical hips gives us vertical pathway, whereas horizontal hips gives us you know, a, a fly out away from the center of the center of gravity or the center of the base, you know, the area of the base is what we call it. So we say hips up, bar up, hips out, bar out. And it's all attributed to the feet. 
And so when we do the Bergen warm-up, the very first thing in our courses, we talk about stance. That's our number one. The very first thing we talk about is stance, grip, and positions. That's what we talk about. And 90% in our philosophy, 90% of all missed lifts are attributed to the feet, to that stance. Yeah. And so you, you're right now running Bergender Strength. Uh, That's be, is, is that like a variation off of what was CrossFit weightlifting because well, they got rid of that programming or? Yeah, Glassman, Glassman came up with the idea that he wanted to do away with all the SMEs, the subject matter experts. So gymnastics, uh, fighting, striking, uh, strongman, weightlifting, all of that. He asked us to, you know, no longer use the name CrossFit weightlifting and they would no longer uh, you know, collect the monies for our courses, but we could become preferred courses for CrossFit. And it was our choice. Uh, we chose to do that, to stay a preferred course. It is exactly the same curriculum, but we're now a uh, preferred course of CrossFit. We teach it exactly the same way. We just cannot use legally, we cannot use the word CrossFit in our, in our genre. Uh, now with the new owner, um, he's a very reasonable guy and he probably wouldn't care if we would do that or not. But, uh, you know, we're not going to fight those battles. And if he comes to me and says, you know, we want to, we want to take a look at or re, you know, reevaluate, you know, burden of strength in its relationship to CrossFit, you know, then we can certainly do that. We're very much fans of CrossFit, the CrossFit community, the CrossFit mentality, uh, we, we very much enjoy that. So we want to be as proactive and as supportive as we can. And you have a level one, a level two, and the level one is available in person and online. Right. It is now the, although no, I, I, I'm not sure the level two is on, is, uh, often online yet. It's not. Yeah. My son, Bo's the one that wrote the curriculum for that. It is such in depth, you know, the level one is all about, uh, fundamentals and, you know, teaching and, and leadership and, you know, how you manage and control a class. And, and, but the level two is really down to the nitty gritty of correcting errors, looking at bar path. You know, you get that in my course, the level one course, but it really doesn't go into the depth as much as it does in the level two. Awesome. And they can find that at, is it burgenderstrength.com? Yes, it is. Okay. So if any of our listeners want to check that out, they can jump online and, and do that. So I, I want to go back, back in time, because um, I am not a Notre Dame fan, but I do understand the historical significance. The, <laughs> <laughs> hey, the, the, owner, of our, the owner of our gym is a huge fan. I am not an Ohio State fan. That should be Yay! enough for everybody. Well, <laughs> well, I am not an go. Ohio State fan either, but there I do go. understand the significance of Notre Dame and Era Parsegian. And you had the you had the the luck or the blessing uh, to be coached by one of the what what some consider one of the greatest coaches in college football history. So what what was that like? Era would let me give you a story about Era Parsegian. So one day in South Bend, as you probably are not really aware, the weather there is just like it is in Southern California. Right. You know, and so it's it's nice and warm year round and balmy. And but anyway, on this one day where it decided it was going to rain and it had been raining for about, I don't know, three or four days straight. And we're getting ready to play. Uh, I can't even remember the opponent, but we're getting ready to play this opponent. And it was going to be a very important game. It might have been USC, which is really a, a big rivalry of Notre Dame. And so the student body, which was at that time was all men. There was no, there was no women in the, at, at the uh, university at all, just all men. So about uh, two o'clock in the afternoon, the student body, you get there's like 6,000 men. And about half of those men came down to Era's office, which is in the Rockney Memorial, which is uh, that's back then, that's where he housed his, uh, his uh, coaches. And it was raining like hell, and these guys are all out in the rain, and they call for era, 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 era. He comes out, and he looks up in the sky, and he says, enough! 
and it stopped raining. <laughs> I shit you not, excuse my language. No one could believe that. But that is what it was like for me. If, if I mean, I worshiped the ground that that guy walked on. And I was scared to death of him because you would never, ever want to be called down to his office. And, and one day I got called to his office and I'm God almighty, I almost didn't go because I was so afraid that there was something, I must've did something wrong. And but I didn't, I, I did everything the right way, right? He called me down in and I'm shaking and he told me I was going to start again. And it was like, oh my God, it was the most unbelievable experience. But that man walked on water as far as I was concerned. He was, he was a leader by example. Um, he was just spectacular, very passionate, uh, very organized. He was, uh, he was actually, you know, a man before his time when it came to calling in plays from the sidelines. Uh, you know, everybody today uses the radio, but, you know, Era used cards to call in plays. So he didn't have to run people back and forth. So the quarterback and Era had meetings all the time. And Era and Tom Pagna, his assistant, would come up with this card system of how he could call in plays. It was amazing. And I was a defensive back, and I played for Johnny Ray, who was a defensive coordinator. But uh, Era was an amazing, amazing man. And several years later, in 1994 or so, and I graduated in 1968, but I took Sage, my son Casey, Cody, Bo, and Cody. We all went back to Notre Dame, and we went into Era's office. And I didn't even know if he would remember me. But I walk in the office with my kids. He's in his office. His secretary was in the office. And he was no longer coaching at this time. He was running an insurance company. And I asked the secretary, I said, Barb, is, is coach in? And from the back room, he said, is that Mike Bergner out there? He said that to me. I'm kidding. I almost cried. <laughs> I mean, right now, it's so emotional that he could remember. And it wasn't just me. It's everybody. That, that's the kind of man that he was. He was spectacular. So how much of him is influence has influenced you as a coach well his organizational abilities have been influenced me a great deal i mean the burden like i said the junk warm up junkyard dog burden of warm up three position snatches three reps from the high hang three reps from the hang three reps from the ground all with pvc pipe gradually moving up in weight as you get better with it that is exactly error procedure and we do that every day regardless of the workout CrossFit, I don't know crap about CrossFit, honest to God. I know about weightlifting. Sage knows about CrossFit. I don't. But I do know the fundamentals of how to make somebody better. In my opinion, I can teach anybody, anybody, how to snatch, clean, and jerk, and front squat. And it's all based on the fundamentals of teaching. So you played defensive back, and you also got to play in a national championship game? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I played uh, Michigan State was our the back in 66 in the 10-10 tie. Uh, you know, played in that game. Played uh, – we were the national champions after we beat SC 51 to nothing. Uh, and, but back then, no one went to bowl games. Uh, at Notre Dame, Notre Dame did not right. go to bowl games. So that was just part of it. And, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was one of the – Greatest experiences of my life, going to Notre Dame and being coached by Father Lang, my weightlifting coach, and by Era. And so you, you started this, this gym in your garage, right? You, you were a school teacher doing phys ed, um, and you were leading young men there and then too. So it, like that was just ingrained in you. Um, yeah, Notre, my, my time as a school teacher, you know, I, I coached football. I played football, so I, I coached football, but, you know, in my jobs, after, I think it was 1979, I took a job in Missouri, and, uh, you know, I had, I was a head coach, and I was also a, uh, a strength coach for my team, uh, and then after I left that position, every other job that I went to, I was known for, as the strength coach, football coach, and then when I went to Vista High School, the 
the uh, uh, school that I came back to California for, I didn't even coach football. I just coached. I just was hired as a strength coach. And then my next job was at Rancho Buena Vista High School. And, uh, you know, I, at that time, that was in 1986, I think it was. And at that time, uh, um, you know, I got paid as much. I, got, I was probably the only high school paid strength coach in the United States at that time. You know, because it just wasn't – strength coaching wasn't – usually the football coach did it. But, uh, you know, I was the uh, head strength coach, and that's what I was – is what I was paid for. And my wife uh, wanted me to have nothing to do with football anymore. And so she, we built a house out in California where we are. And she says, why don't you, uh, I mean, I'd go to work at six o'clock in the morning. I had two boys, Casey and Bo. I'd go to work at six o'clock in the morning. And then I'd come home at six o'clock at night, seven o'clock at night. And uh, the kids were already in bed. And so she was saying, well, you never see your kids. And I'm going, well, what do you want me to do? This is my job. And she said, I want you to build a gym in the garage. I'm going, whoa, you got to be kidding me, right? And, uh, and that's what I did. We started, uh, I got, I was asked to speak at conventions and things like that. And I got a, I got a stipend for it. And so all the money I made doing that, I put into the gym. So the kids, I'd go to work at six in the morning, but I'd come home at three thirty or four in the afternoon, and all the kids at school would follow me home. But I was, but I got to be with my children at that time too. So you know, it wasn't in my in my world. My wife was not going to tolerate me being a Era Parsegian or a Woody Hayes and a Vince Lombardi. She wanted me home with the children and with the family as well. And so were your children getting to observe and watch the whole time than watching you coach and watching you, you know, train all these athletes? Well, I'll let her answer that. Yeah. I mean, I always tell people that I never remember learning how to coach this stuff. I didn't like go to a course or basically I was just, when I was 15, 14 or 15 years old, I had a gym ask if I wanted to come out and do a seminar for them. I'm like, you sure you are you like asking for my dad or do you want me to come and do it? And they're like, no, we want you to come and do it. And I was so nervous. I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to teach this. I don't know what to do, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden I started talking and all of the words just started spilling out. And I was like, oh my gosh, I know exactly what to say. What is going on right now? It was just absorbed from a lifetime of observing. We were never inside when we got home from school. We got home from school and we're out in that garage for hours watching and listening and hearing and lifting with all of these world champion, world-class athletes, high school students, college students, whatever, doesn't matter. And we didn't even realize it that we were soaking in and taking in everything that my dad was saying. So it was really, really cool. Like on a subconscious level, how much we were taking in from just being around it every single day. And it kind of infected all of your siblings, right? Um, you have, you have an Olympian as, as a son that did weightlifting. Uh, your other son is coaching as well with Olympic lifting. And Sage yeah, Bo, has just taken off. You have Casey, who is in the Navy now. And he was, uh, you know, he was, he was the guy that really started it off with the Bergners because he's the oldest. Uh, and then Bo was, uh, he was more volleyball and, uh, you know, uh, water polo, surfing, that kind of free spirit attitude type of stuff. But he also lifted weights. He was the national champion. And then Cody was baseball, but every one of my kids were national champions, either school age national champions or junior national champions. But Casey went to the full extent where he lifted in world championships and, and the Olympics and, you know, that way. But our rule was this. We wanted our, our kids had to play a sport. We didn't care if it was weightlifting. My wife and I talked about this. I wasn't going to force them to do any of this stuff. I wanted them. They had to play a sport. They got to choose the sport they played. However, they had to lift weights to protect their bodies. So, you know, just, it just kind of was there. It, uh, they learned how to snatch and clean and jerk with PVC pipe and then PVC pipe full of sand and, you know, and, and taking it up from there. And, and it wasn't, we coached them. It, like Sage said, they just, 
they would watch Tommy Goff, who was a 96 Olympian, train here. Uh, they'd come out and watch the beach volleyball Olympians work out. And they just mimicked what they saw. And then I'd coach them, I'd, you know, I, but I'd never force them, you know, to, to do the things that they want. And, you know, my wife and I had a rule that in the gym, I was the boss. And in the house, she was the boss. So, you know, if they started pissing and moaning about, you know, the way I was coaching them, if I was too hard on them, you know, then yeah, that was okay. That's your dad's, that's your dad's job. So they'd run to mama and no, that's your, that's your dad's job. And then later on at night in the bedroom, then she'd get on my ass about it. <laughs> <laughs> so coach, I have a, I have a question. Um, clearly the strength and conditioning and Olympic lifting are a little bit different, right? You're not, football players aren't snatching and things like that, or at least not with a barbell. How did you make that transition from strength and conditioning over to the Olympic lifts? Well, in, in my world, that's that's what we did. I mean, I've been did. doing okay. snatch and clean and jerk since 1964 when I was at Notre Dame. And, you know, back then we had the clean and press, the snatch, and the clean and jerk. So any place that I went, I, I taught strength training. But I also, my students, in, in order to get a, a good grade in my class, my students had to show proficiency in the snatch, the clean and jerk, and the front squat. And I never graded them on how much weight they lifted. I graded them on a 10 point scale. And there were two points out of five positions that they had to, they had to get. And if a, an athlete got an eight or a better, then I, that was a passable lift. If they got less than an eight, it was an unpassable lift. <clears throat> so if we're all competing and Sage and I are, are competing and Sage snatches 200 pounds, but she gets a seven on it, but I snatch a hundred pounds and get an eight. I beat her because her lift was not, it wasn't passed. So the reason is, is that now she's got to make a decision. Yeah, I can lift more weight, but it's terrible technique. This guy's got good technique and eventually he's going to come up and beat me. So what do I end up doing? I come back down, learn the technique. And then I learn, I learn how to lift the heavier weights anyway, using the right technique. So Sage, I heard, I heard a story where you were talking about the time where you got really stubborn and you wanted to be an Olympic weightlifter and your dad told you in a very blunt way that he didn't think that was the right decision, but you went ahead and went forward with it. Are the, are those the confrontations you have in the gym that are left to your dad and you kind of having that or, and, and then after that, did he support you? even though he didn't think that was the right avenue? I mean, my parents never really could ever tell me what to do, to be honest. Still can. <laughs> um, I've always sort of had that personality where I always wanted to do things my way. So all of our confrontation was about the fact that at 13 years old, I was convinced I knew more about everything than my dad knew about anything. Even weightlifting, I was convinced I knew how to coach better than him. So teenagers yes, tend to think that. What's that? <laughs> teenagers tend to think they know everything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so when my dad told my dad was always he never sugarcoated anything with us. We knew we weren't going to get that. And obviously, you know, I was the fourth child, and I was the only girl that he had. He didn't know how to raise a girl at all. Now that I'm older, I'm very, very thankful for that because it gave me some thick skin. But when I was younger, you know, and I'm a very emotional person, I still am to this day. It's hard when your, your dad just gives it to you straight, you know, and, and I am, I was better at every other sport than I was at Olympic weightlifting, but I had a love and passion for it. The same love and passion that he had. So I think it was more of like, okay, well, he doesn't think I'm going to be able to do it. I'm going to really show him. And um, I did it because I loved it. I did it because I wanted to prove something. I never ended up being amazing at it, but I still loved it so much throughout my whole entire weightlifting journey. I, I've never stopped loving the sport. I've never stopped doing the sport at any phase of my life. It was just I think I finally realized that maybe the Olympics weren't in the cards for me, but that doesn't, that doesn't change my training regimen at all. It doesn't change my love for the sport. doesn't change my passion for the sport. 
And in fact, I think that that showed how much more I love the sport because of my willingness to do it just because, not because I was aiming for something. Does that make sense? Totally. Totally. And yeah. so yeah, she's a better coach now than I ever was. Oh, I don't know about that. But. <laughs> well, she, I mean, of, of all the kids, I mean, it, you know, out of respect for her, it's like, I, I say that Sage is my fourth son, you know, and she's more like me than any of my boys, you know? So, uh, uh, she won't listen for shit, but uh, it's like, you know, <laughs> if she would have done everything I told her to do, she'd probably be a millionaire right now. <laughs> yeah, uh, this this is Sage. So Sage at 14 or so comes up with the idea of wearing mismatched socks. And, you know, CrossFit's just taken off. And uh, so she's wearing around these mismatched socks. All of a sudden, if people see her, they see this 14-year-old doing the snatch and clean and jerk, but she's wearing mismatched socks. Everybody starts selling, uh, starts uh, wearing mismatched socks. So I told Sage, I said, look, let's start a business and we're going to call them Sage Socks, you know, and we're going to be, they're going to be sold in mismatched sets. And her comment to me was, that sounds great, daddy. Will you run it? <laughs> and I said, no, I want us to both run it. You run it. You're, you're the business owner. and I'm going to teach you about business. But no, she didn't want to do that. She wanted me to run it. So, I mean, so today. No, that wasn't true. <laughs> oh, I, it's not that I wanted him to run it. I didn't think it was something that would take off at all. I'm like, no one's going to do that. Like, no one's going to buy mismatched socks. And then all of a sudden, everyone was wearing mismatched socks. But I, I kind of feel like he's a little biased. I'm sure I did not start the mismatched sock trend. <laughs> but he's my dad. So he's obviously going to believe that. And I'm just going to go with it because it makes me sound really cool. So I'm <laughs> fine with that. Just own it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, I have a 19-year-old daughter, and I've bought a lot of pairs of mismatched socks. <laughs> <laughs> um. So then you somehow got hooked up with CJ Martin, Sage? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So when I was 18, I went off to Northern Michigan University. Um, that was one of the schools that offered scholarships for weightlifting. There was three schools at the time, really. It was uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, Northern Michigan, and then Colorado Springs. Colorado Springs was the Olympic training center. That was like the Mecca. That's where everybody wanted to go, what they were shooting for. That was my goal. Um, and then, but they didn't offer full ride scholarships. Northern Michigan university offered full ride scholarships and their, their program was starting to really develop there. And so that's where I decided to go to college um, but because I like to do things the really hard way, I decided after a semester of being there that I was super homesick. I didn't love Northern Michigan. I wanted to come back to California. Um, but I didn't want to move back in with my parents because I wanted to get out of the house as early as possible. And so right about that time, CJ was opening up CrossFit Invictus. And so my dad had told him, yeah, my daughter is moving back. And so CJ reached out to me and he said, would you like to run our Olympic weightlifting program at Invictus? I was like, yeah, perfect timing. <laughs> so I moved back down to San Diego and started at CrossFit Invictus, running their Olympic lifting program. And then that's sort of how I got into the competitive CrossFit world. Um, that was the same year that they had the very first affiliate cup at the CrossFit Games. Um, so I was a part of that when it was still at the ranch, which was really, really cool. Um, was on that team for a couple of years. And that's where I met my uh, ex-husband. And we moved to Italy. Hello, Mom. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Um, yes. And so, yeah, that was kind of how my CrossFit, my introduction to the CrossFit world came to be. And CrossFit Invictus was really, really amazing place to start because CJ was a really smart guy. He was a lawyer previously and he knew a lot about fitness and fitness and the world of fitness, but he also knew how to find really smart people. 
So I was surrounded by incredibly intelligent coaches. And so I learned a lot of other aspects of strength and conditioning that I never had learned before in that environment, which was really cool and an amazing opportunity when you're so young. Yeah, uh, that's a great person to learn from. So how long were you at Invictus before you went to Italy? I was there for three years, like two and a half, three years, went to Italy for three years, went to Hawaii for three years, and then came back to California. And so where are you with, you're with Bergener Strength now, right? Yes, I do. Um, I do some work for my brother with Bergner Strength. So Bergner Strength is his business, but basically he's just taken everything that my dad has done and built off of that. So I'll always be involved with Bergner Strength in some capacity. All the Bergners kind of stick together. Um, it is more of his business, so it'd be more of like, hey, I need you to come in and do this for me. So more of like an independent contractor. And I do a lot of stuff just on my own as well. But I think Bergner's kind of all just, we all work together in one big regime, you know? So Mike, have you ever saw, sat back and thought about the legacy that you've, you've left with, with all of your kids kind of keeping on that Olympic weightlifting tradition? Uh, I, you know, I, I'm not a legacy person, you know, I'm, I'm more of a right now type type person. Uh, um, the, the fact that my kids, every one of our, my kids were national champions, whether school age or junior national champions it, is the thing that just honors me the most. Uh, Casey married, uh, married, uh, an Olympian, you know, uh, Natalie Wolfolk, uh, was an Olympian in 2000 and in 2008 in Beijing. And, uh, you know, Bo is, you know, Bo, uh, has done all the Olympic lifts and is a great coach. Bo owns Bergner strength. I own the curriculum for the, for the bird, the courses, but Bo owns Bergner strength. So at my age now at 74, I'm just kind of sitting back and I don't want to be the head coach anymore. I want to be the guy that's going to be there to help people, you know, get along and, and try to help them getting better in the, the snatch and clean and jerk. And that's really what I want to be known for is that I want to pay it forward. I want to give, give more than I receive, um, you know, and, and I've been very blessed. I've received so much. It's just amazing. And, and those the things that I've received is just the support and of others, you know, the, the, the Arab Parsegians, the Father Langs, the, you know, John Ray's, the Richard Borden's, all these guys have been, been there for me. And they kind of taught me the one thing and that's to pay it forward, you know, just to give, give more than, than, than you, you want to receive. And I would say just from the kid's perspective, that is the legacy that he that I think that we hope to embody for him is when we coach, we don't ever coach for money. Whenever any, we're in any sort of gym, none of us can keep our mouths shut. We'll just walk straight up to somebody and start coaching them on something. And nowadays, everybody, no one wants to do anything for free, which we can understand. We all need to make money. We all, you know, we all have bills to pay and whatnot, but my dad has never been that way. He's only ever coached because he's really loved it and he's really loved to help people. And I think my brothers and I all developed, we saw that growing up. And so that is all something that we, we like to be as genuine as possible as well, because that was the standard that we saw throughout life, which is, I feel very fortunate about. I mean, if my dad walks into a CrossFit gym that's kind of new and they don't really know what's going on much and they're not sure who he is, he's not going to be the one that walks in and is like, do you know who I am? I'm kind of a big deal, right? It's usually it has to be one of us like, hey, have you ever heard of the Bergner warm-up? Yeah, this is the guy right here. He's so <laughs> humble. And so I think that's the legacy. He's you would never know what he's done and how much he knows and how amazing he is if, because he won't ever say it. Somebody else has to say it for them. And I think that's really freaking cool. 
Because most people like to toot their own horn. They like to let people know who they are. And he's not going to be like that. So can I have my hundred dollars for saying yeah. all that? <laughs> <laughs> I just gonna say I wish my wife felt like that. Jesus! Oh my gosh, she does. <laughs> well, I have I have a really funny story. Um, I know that you did some commentary for the Rogue Invitational, um, and I actually judged that event. Oh, um, did you? With with Sax and Pancheck. Oh my God! Yeah. And so when he finished uh, the, the one rep max, when he was done, everybody ran over to a computer to roll back the stream to see what you said about them. Uh, and just, they, they just wanted to hear what you had to say about his lift, uh, which was really cool. And I, and I found that uh, to be a really neat thing that Saxon did and how much he respects your opinion. Well, I, I really appreciate that. There's times, though, I can't keep my mouth shut. That's the <laughs> <laughs> that was the best part of the whole Rogue Invitational was watching yeah. you watch everybody's lifts. Oh, I was like, oh, God, that looks awful. <laughs> <Yeah>. Oh, boy. <laughs> I don't yeah, know how I did that one. Like, I, I don't really want to but that's ugly. I don't yeah. want to meet that guy on a street corner someplace because he'll probably shoot my ass. <laughs> oh, no. Some of the I, coaches for the uh, Bergner Strength courses, we have this group text thread. And so as this Rogue Invitational was going on, we were just listening to the things that my dad was saying, and then we would just text it to each other, like a little – captions of things that coach b says <laughs> it was amazing well i'm, it, I'm it telling was. you you could you could start your own sort of youtube channel with just showing film of athletes lifting whoever they might be and you just having a voice voiceover oh people would gosh. pay money to watch that it was it was really special because he is old enough where he can pretty much say whatever he wants now. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm Absolutely. harmless, so no one, no one <laughs> no. is going to take offense to it. So, <laughs> As, I, I'm not trying to be offensive. It's just, you know. You can't help it. It's just, yeah. It. It's, Some of it's like in your DNA. Yeah, exactly. I do Something have to call that. him out sometimes for like, comments about women or something i'm like you're not that old yet it's like still a little <laughs> creepy right now so so if a beautiful woman comes out she's very fit like a tia and she's got her bikini on i'll say wowzer you look fit girl and she gets all huff and buffed about it you know <laughs> that's not a comment in which i would get huffed and buffed about <laughs> he's toning it down for us yeah. Um, because you guys have focused, or you know, you talk so much about drills and skills and fundamentals. I'm curious because I feel like this would really help out Charlie and especially Scott. How important do you think mobility especially? is? Um, well, mobility is the number one. Hey. In our, you, at our course, we talk about the number one criteria to be a good weightlifter in this order it's mobility, speed, and then strength. And too many beginning lifters come in, especially they've come from football or they've come from powerlifting, they put that strength first. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, a, that's an issue because they'll never be able to be as good as they could possibly be unless they have the proper mobility. So one of the things, I mean, this last weekend, I had a, a, a lady come down here from Malibu. She's a master's lifter. And she needs a lot. She's very lean. She, but she's, you know, she's a geezerette, a mamba, mothers against making bingo arms, right? She's one of those gals. And we started working on our technique on, on, on our mobility. And I mean, I kicked her ass with just PVC pipe. And then we started working on the split snatch and the split clean. It's the same pull. But I wanted her to snatch in the split style, clean in the split style, and then continue to work on her mobility at least for 15 minutes a day. And we believe in mobility under tension. You know, we're going to go under the – there's nothing I can do to stretch to get where I need to be. So I'm going to put a barbell over my head using a snatch grip, and then I'm going to go down into an overhead squat. And I'm not going to allow that person to give me bad technique. So they're going to go all the way down. It's going to be terrible technique. I'm going to bring them up where they're only down, you know, six inches because six inches is six inches is that position where they can maintain good technique. And then I'm going to take them down one millimeter at a time, stretch, bring them back up, stretch, bring them back up, hold them in that tension 
for a long time. And you do that 15 minutes a day, it works. But some people it might take a month. You know, other people, if they're heavily involved in powerlifting, it could take over a year and that's with them giving up powerlifting. Mm. Yeah, I think it's just finding a balance between working your mobility and then also finding enjoyment with doing the lifts. Because it'd be like telling someone, you're not allowed to do kipping pull-ups until you can do a strict pull-up. And it's like, okay, I understand the rhyme and reason behind that, but where's the enjoyment factor in this, mm -hmm. right? Same thing with mobility that takes such a long time to develop. Let's work it beforehand. Let's spend our 15 minutes. Let's do our due diligence in making ourselves better. But then we're going to let them lift. And like my dad said, we're going to just let them go down to a position where they can be safe and efficient with their movement. But we're not going to be the ones that are like, oh, you're not mobile. Well, guess what? Looks like for the next three years, you're only doing a snatch with the PVC pipe until you get more mobile. Because there's no level in, of enjoyment there and you're not going to be keeping people's interest. Right. You know, so kind of just finding that balance, working with the person, being like, I'll give you what you want, but you have to give me what I want a little bit too. And remember the goals of the person. I mean, how many people are going to lift in the Olympics, right? How many people are going to be at a national level or, you know, American open level? Most of the people that we get will probably never lift in a weightlifting contest. But that's our goal is to get them to experience the fun of having that. Yeah. So for us, we want them to be safe, efficient, and effective. That's our mantra. We, our goal of our course is to teach coaches how to teach their athletes, their clients, in a very safe, efficient, and effective method. And we're going to work on that mobility, but like Sage says, I'm going to do the split snatch because most people can do the split snatch much easier than they can do the, the, the regular snatch. You know, so we're going to do, we're going to do whatever it is to take and teach them the proper pull the right way. It's just a matter of where they receive it. If they receive it, if it's a lightweight, they can receive it in a power, a power split snatch, a full snatch, whatever. But typically, you know, they're going to be able to achieve the level of competence that they need to achieve. A geezer crossfitter, if I can get a geezer to lift in a weightlifting contest when they're 50 years old and the master's level, I've got them because they love it. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of, you know, setting their goals where they want to be and then teach according to your goals. Well, you kind of brought up geezer crossfit. Are you still doing geezer crossfit? Oh yeah, Monday, Wednesday and Fridays. Can't, I can't, I don't know see if you can it. see this. It's got Mike's gym on it. I'll, I'll do it. You can see Mike's gym. It's kind of hard to see the blue, but it says geezer's, geezer's rule. rule. Okay, then I'm going to turn around. Come on. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> okay. okay. So, so we have geezer in training, 50 to 59. Geezer, 60 to 64. Stud geezer, 65 to 69. Super stud geezer, 70 to 74. That's this guy. And then the day-to-day -day geezer is 75 plus. <laughs> You'd be amazed. I walk, I walk down to beach and I get all these guys that got time on their hands, right? So they're walking on the beach and they see my shirt and they all want to buy it from me. <laughs> well, I, I just hit that baby geezer. I hit 50 this year, so. Oh, you're oh, just a geezer. You're not even a, you're, I shouldn't even count you as a geezer in training. <laughs> That's super old. <laughs> yeah, it's super old. I'm, I'm knocking on the door. I'm knocking on the door. So I'll be there soon too. So coach, talk to us a little bit about how your garage, um, talk a little bit about the fire and how, how are you back to hundred percent operating in the garage and, and all that? Yeah. Our, you know, unfortunately we, I was actually in new Orleans with my wife when, uh, at the world war II museum on December 7th, when the fires mm. took, took place. Right. So, uh, my son, Bo was here and he probably saved the house. You know, he was turned on all the water hoses and sprayed stuff down, but the outside area where we had a, uh, outdoor living area and an apartment out there for family and, 
you know, jacuzzi and pool and stuff. Those were all destroyed. But uh, um, yeah, it it was uh, it was a challenge. We had a lot of smoke damage, but uh, you know, I learned a lot about insurance companies and how evil they are. Uh, I had to become very smart of, about you know how I dealt with them uh, and hiring the right people. I actually wrote an article for on I think I did it on Instagram basically and tried to tell people to make sure they looked at their uh, insurance policies because everything isn't as it seems, you know. But anyway, yeah, we we got back in the house. The smoke was cleared out, and Sage had her team up here, and they took all the equipment out of the room and disinfected it and repainted it. And we were back in the gym before we were back in the house. You know, and, and the boss and I, uh, one thing that we did have in our policy and we adhered to, whatever the house, our house was going to be rented for, we could have a like kind. Well, this house could be rented for five or 6,000 bucks a month. So we ended up getting uh, houses on the beach in Carlsbad, California, right smack dab on the beach. And so we had a good time yeah. for about three or four months living at the beach. And that was, that was a lot of fun. So going through that, I know that you've talked about your faith before and that, that how important that is to you. Uh, did that help you get through that time? Oh, of course. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I go up and down on my faith. I'm, I was raised a Catholic. I had Catholicism knocked, you know, knocked between my eyes with my mother. And I had to have, I, at six years old, I was serving mass at a VA hospital every morning. And, so, and then, then where do I go? To Notre Dame, right? Dame. I used to go to Notre Dame. I went to mass every single day at Notre Dame. Wow. You know, I just it was it was in my brain housing group. And then when I joined the Marine Corps, <clears throat> I don't know, I kind of fell off the bandwagon a little bit. But uh, you know, I, it it's it it's hit and miss. I when when I am in in my realm of being a faithful person, you know, with Catholicism, uh, I feel peace, and uh, you know, I feel very good about it. And, you know, it's just, and I don't, I don't really practice the doctrine of Catholicism. I mean, I don't have to go to confession to feel like I've been forgiven. Um, but I do go to confession, you know, when I go and, and I, but I can sit here in this office and say, you know, point up to the sky and say, hey, forgive me for being such a dumbass, you know, or stuff like that. So I'm a little bit more lenient with myself than before. Uh, you know, but I believe me when I tell you, I was raised in a very, very strict Catholic family. My mom was strict. My grandmother was very, very strict. And, uh, you know, and I was going to be a priest, believe it or not, not in my mind, but in their mind. <laughs> okay. Yeah. They wanted me to be a, a, a man of cloth. Hell, I got kicked out of Catholic school when I was in kindergarten for fighting. <laughs> And, and your dad was a, an All-American football player as well, correct? He was. He was at James Milliken University in Decatur, Illinois. Yeah, he was, uh, he was unbelievable. He was a uh, – dad was a uh, coal miner, and he was a dairy farmer. He, owned, he actually owned a dairy. And wow. uh, probably the hardest man I've ever been around. You know, he was really, really tough. But you know what? Uh, we had, I had three siblings, and uh, I was the only one that got spanked. And I was the oldest. I had two two uh, sisters. They never got spanked. And the reason they didn't, because I think I took all the punishment and scared them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dairy farming's tough work. I grew up in Western Pennsylvania and did a summer on a dairy farm. Oh, yeah. Uh, would, don't ever want to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've had my fill of baling hay. My, I tell everybody, my wife is a... Is a uh, She's like a yard Nazi. I mean, she loves to work in the yard and stuff like that. Because of my upbringing, I never want to work in the yard again. So I tell people, if they will call me, I'll give them all the advice they want for free. Just keep my ass out of the yard. <laughs> because we have this deal that if I'm not working, then, uh, then I have to get out there and, and, and do some yard stuff. And I hate it. <laughs> Too many bad memories. You mentioned your time in the Marines. Uh, how, what was that like? Did that help shape who you are? Absolutely. You know, I'm, I've got two, 
two screws lo loose up on top anyway. And I'm very passionate about what I do. And the, the Marine Corps taught me how to address people. I mean, I can, I never had a problem being in a classroom and dressing my class. I never have had a problem in front of a large group of people, you know, talking about what I know about. And that was because of the Marine Corps. One of, one of the points that we had to do as a Marine officer is that we had to prepare a speech and we had to present that speech to, you know, to our, to our peers who were other Marine officers. Um, and I was nervous about presenting because I didn't know what to present on. I, I don't know a lot of stuff, but I did know about football and I did know about weightlifting. So I had my proctor was a Marine captain and he said, well, Lieutenant Bergman, why don't you just talk about how to, how a Marine platoon is similar to a football team or about a Marine platoon and how you work with individuals in that platoon the same way you work with individuals when you coach weightlifting. I nailed it. And so, you know, for me, it's always been one of those things. I never want to talk about something I'm not familiar with because I'll screw it up. But give me the microphone when I talk about weightlifting or football, and then I can't shut up. <laughs> That's awesome. That's the trip. I want to. So I the Marine Corps gears. brought that to the table. The Marine Corps taught me that. That's great. Uh, I wanted to switch gears a little bit and, and focus on Sage. Um, you have become um, a little bit of the poster child for um, body positivity um, for women. And I just wondered sort of, and appreciate all the content that you put out for that, just wondered sort of where that comes from. Where do you find, you know, that either inspiration or strength to sort of be out there um, to talk about that kind of stuff and to help other women, you know, feel better about how they're feeling and looking? Um, I think, like I said before, I've always been very, very emotional. And when I was a teenager, I had, I had terrible acne, terrible skin. And that really damages a young kid. I mean, you can go ask anybody who has skin issues <laughs> what it does to them. It can be very, very traumatizing during an age range where kids are ruthless, right? And so um, I went through a really dark time and I had to figure out, I was either going to stay really down and really kind of hate myself, or I was gonna have to develop a really good personality and be funny and be kind and use all of my emotion to connect with other people so that I was more than my insecurities and that having to go through, which it sounds really vain. And when I think about it, I think, you know, how many like actual real problems people face in their daily lives that, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with something physical, but you know, everybody is affected by their insecurities in different ways. And as humans, we're, we're not perfect. And I feel like we are kind of uh, vain and we are really hard on ourselves. And I just, I feel all of these emotions so deeply that I have a really soft spot for others who are struggling. Um, and I can, I've always been able to read people very well. I think it came from growing up in a gym and being a coach, you know, you have to learn how to feel the sort of vibe that people give off so that you know how to coach them, to get them through a lift, to get them through a mental block. And my dad was always someone who like really paid attention to that mental side. Um, and so I've always been able to read people very well. And I started to figure out that because of what I had gone through, because of the emotions that I had felt all grew growing up, I had a lot of connection with other people. And I felt like I could really help them and get through to them. And and I started as I got older and older and had kids and went through all these body changes with pregnancy and post-pregnancy and, you know, being an athlete, being a mom, trying to be a competitive athlete after being a mom. Um, I just have a lot of life experience. And I would meet so many women who would open up to me and I would realize that everybody is struggling. 
and women especially are so hard on themselves. We want to be perfect in every capacity. We think we should be able to do it all and do it all amazingly. And, um, and I just felt like your calling is trying to help other women feel badass and feel beautiful and feel strong and feel powerful because I look at women and I think that they are the most powerful beings on this whole entire planet. Men as well, just in a different way. But women are so incredibly powerful and we can find that through fitness. We can find that through connecting with each other. We can find that through talking about things that we're struggling with and feeling. And I don't know, it just kind of all manifested organically and throughout time. And so I just kind of wanted to be that person that other people felt like, man, I really needed to hear that today from someone that maybe appears like she has it all together. We all on Instagram appear like we have it all together. And I don't want to be that person. I want to be that person that she says that she doesn't really have it all together. She says that she struggles. She's showing us her insecurities, her struggles with things, but she's not giving up. She's still fighting. She's still trying to get her emotions under control. She's still trying to have a good positive mindset. She's still trying to train her ass off and deal with her demons and everything that are coming out. So I just wanted to be real for people so that other people feel like they can be authentic and genuine as well. That was the longest answer ever and I hope that it answered your question. <laughs> no, that was that was great. And I think, you know, you showing your vulnerability in a way shows, you know, your strength, which I think, you know, ladies like to see and and can feel. So thank you. Vulnerability is very, very hard for yeah. people. It's so uncomfortable. It's very hard. We like to show our surfaced perfect selves but it's just not reality. And so I think the best thing you can do as a person is share that with others and share how you get through it. Yeah, agreed. Well, I think that's a great place to end. I think that was a, an awesome message to end with. So I wanna thank both of you for taking some time out with us today. Uh, it was a great conversation. It was great getting to know both of you. Um, and I, I just had a lot of fun. Well, thank you thank very you much. Thank you guys for having us. We really appreciate it. It's fun sharing this stuff because it's, uh, you know, just shows you that we're just normal people like everybody else. And, uh, and that's all we're trying to do, you know, just be normal. That's yeah. great. Except her. She can't be normal. Yeah, she'll <laughs> never be normal. Nor should she be. Exactly. It's great to hear your story because you can you can feel and we can see your passion for, for, for helping people and for sharing your knowledge. And so I appreciate you taking the time to share your, your stories with us today. Well, thank Absolutely. you. Appreciate it, guys. And, yeah. and both of you have that passion. That must be a, a family trait. Uh, I did feel like the only drawback to this was Charlie talked way too much. It was really uncomfortable. <laughs> he really as usual a lot of the time. Yeah. So if you could work on that next time, Charlie, I would really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I, that's usually what I do here. <laughs> yeah. Well, that brings up a good point. We should have you back for sure because I had probably fifty more questions I would have loved to have talked to you about. So, agree to come back, and we'll make sure Charlie has something to say. Awesome. <laughs> I do and, go Irish. And, Andy's a Notre Dame fan. Oh, Charlie. Okay, I like you already, man. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you weren't on uh, what's that house or something like oh that? Oh my God, you literally <laughs> you look, look like exactly that guy, like him. Okay, yeah, get it. get it all the time. And the I guy from Shark Tank. Yeah, I bet you you do. That is crazy. That is for sure. Mm -hmm. Too much. I well, let's do it again the soon. Time. Thank you guys very much. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to go work on my mobility now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the burner warm up. That's yep. right. right. For sure. Okay, we'll Bye. talk to you guys soon. Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 Bye.